Yes, uh, I'm so excited to speak about all your discoveries and how this is profoundly impacting our whole universe and our way of thinking and behaving. And and um, tell us because it gets quite complex. I know you've done decades of uh, decades of research, um, and you have the Resonance Foundation project. Is that right? Yeah, the Resonance Project Foundation. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And uh, you appear in many movies, and you travel, and you do very exciting work. And, and what I love is that you s you simplify a lot of this science that became so complex. It's so hard for mm -hmm. ordinary people like us to understand. Tell us. Well, actually, I think that um, if a science concept or theory is correct, then it should be simple enough that a seven-year-old should understand it. Nice. Yeah, I think that there's, you know, incredible complexity in our world, and we can see that in our environment all, all around. But I think that at the foundation of the universal creation um, structure, there is simple and beautiful principles that anybody can understand. Mm. So y you uh, have the scientific evidence to say that we're all one, we're all unified. Can you tell us more about that research that you have and how you came upon that? All right, well, actually, in my latest paper, which is unpublished, it's in peer review right now, it passed the first level of peer review, I'm really excited about it. I actually flushed that out, and it comes out naturally from the equation. I'm not, you know, attempting to make that proof, it's just a proof that comes out directly out of the equations that I've been writing. And um, it's, a, it's equations that are attempting to unify physics. And as a result, it unifies everything, and it's it's remarkable. And if I was to describe it in simple terms and in in easy way to describe, um, basically, uh, it was found almost a hundred years ago that space, the vacuum, the space between things, the space between planets and stars and galaxies, or the space between atoms in a in a molecule or the space inside the atom, which is 99.99999% space, uh, is not empty. It's full. Um, that we're bathing in a fundamental energy that's at the source of all of creation. And actually, this was known by many ancient civilizations all around the world in earlier time. And then was kind of lost through uh, the advancements of physics. And I think we're coming back to it now. Um, realizing the, in quantum theory, it's called vacuum fluctuations. And, and when they were discovered, when we tried to analyze how much of these fluctuations, how much energy there was in the space inside the atom, uh, we found that it was infinitely dense with energy, that the vacuum, that space inside the atom is not empty at all, but full of energy. And it might be hard to conceptualize, but maybe an example I could give is like, right around us right now, there's all sorts of, you know, microwaves and radio waves and all this stuff. And we think there's nothing, you know, until we take a radio station, for instance, and tune it in, and then we hear a voice, and we realize, yes, they, there's, you know, radio waves going around, and so on. It's a little bit like that. We look at the vacuum, we look at space, and we think it's empty. Mm -hmm. But in it, embedded in it, is this incredible energy that my theories are starting to show is actually the source of everything, the source of all the material world, which is mostly space. When we're talking about this stuff, you know, all of our material, we're made out of 99.99999% space, and that space is full of all this information. And it is the medium that connects all things. Uh, so for instance, when I, I analyze the amount of energy inside the volume of a proton, which is the nuclei of an atom. It's really, really, really teeny. It's the teeniest little thing. When I, s I analyze how much of this vacuum energy there is there, I find the exact mass of the universe. That is, all the other protons in the universe, all the other atoms in the universe are holographically expressed within one proton, showing that it's all interconnected. So magnificent. So, so we are all that. Every single moment in our life, we are connected to all that is. There is a way for us to connect to this infinite source of energy. We've been separated from it for a long time. That's right. And when you actually um, uh, look at all the great masters that walked the earth and 
try to teach us new ways of being and, and expand our mind and expand our consciousness, they all talked about turning inwards and going towards the singularity, towards the center where, you know, this energy where we could connect with the universe, where we could connect, you know, they might have said with God or, you know, but it has always been there in so many ancient tradition. And, you know, now I think we're, it's time to write the physics for it and understand how it actually works. And then when I did, not only did I get the mass of the universe, but I can, I, from the relationship of these vacuum fluctuation on the surface of the proton to the inside vacuum fluctuation, I was able to extract an exact solution to gravity. I was, exa I was ab able to exa extract the exact mass of the standard mass of the proton. I was able to extract how many particles there is in our universe, how big is our universe, what is its energy level, how many of our universe universes there is in a larger one, how many of those ones there is in a larger one, because now we've got the yardstick, now we've got the measuring scale so that we can understand the whole thing, because you know, this realization that we're actually bathing in a field that connects all things, and it's, it's holographic and fractal in nature, so from analy analyzing a piece appropriately, we can understand the whole. So, so now where do you take this from there? Because I know you have projects uh, about um, and, and helping humanity and helping and transforming energy and how we use energy and, and mm -hmm. sustainability. I mean, mm -hmm. this has a huge impact. Tell us of the implications that it has on our real day-to-day -day life, all your, all your work. Well, there's huge implications as we were discussing, you know, philosophically and spiritually, but as well technologically, because obviously now if you start to understand that there is an energy available everywhere that makes everything we see, now all you got to do is understand how that energy works and then reproduce that in laboratory and all of a sudden you would have access to an incredible amount of energy, right? And it's not like you would be depleting it. Okay, first of all, it's extremely large. As I said, when we first calculated, it seemed to be infinitely large, but then we renormalize it. That, that is, we use a constant to cut the number so we, we'd have a finite number. But even when we did that, the finite number is 10 to the 93 grams per centimeter cube. That is, 10 to the 93 grams is like an extremely large number. If you, if you were to take all the stars in the universe, there's billions of stars in all galaxies, and, we, and there's billions of galaxies, and you took them all, like every atom in the universe, and squished them all into a centimeter cube of space. Can you imagine how dense that would be, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, that would be about 10 to the 55th grams per centimeter cube. You'd still need to add 39 zeros to that density before you reach the density of the vacuum, the, the incredible amount of energy that's present. So imagine that we tap one-tenth of one billionth of a percent of what's there. We would have enough energy to run the whole planet for thousands and thousands of years. So we're talking, you know, an incredible source. And, and not only would we not be depleted because it's a huge source, but because when you use it, it radiates back into the vacuum. So you're just entering the feedback loop of nature that's already there. And all you're doing is, you know, participating with the dynamic of the universe as it works naturally. So then your, your society becomes harmonious. You stop destroying your environment to extract energy. Um, you know, all sorts of applications come from it. You can, you know, if, if it's correct, and as I'm showing in my equations, um, you should be able to create gravitational field so now we're talking space drives, we're talking wormhole capability, we're talking traveling across the universe. I mean, a whole new world uh, becomes available to us. Very, very exciting. Um, 
some of us are awakening in this world, realizing this, realizing how free this energy is from everybody. And we're like, what's been going on? Why have we been separated from that? What have the government been doing? Mm -hmm. What kind of mess are we in, you know, and how mm -hmm. can we get out of it? Mm -hmm. So in, within all of that, like how... This is incredible that it, w is it, is, did some people actually realize this before and it was holded back from us or mm -hmm. are we just truly just discovering that on all levels because we've heard of time travel, um, some different projects, some all kind of things have been happening and these amazing projects seems to be suppressed from greed, from money, from institutions. Mm -hmm. What is your whole perception on that? Well, I think there's, well, that's a complex issue and it, it goes all the way back to the Egyptians and the Mayans, the Incas. Um, there's a lot of evidence that there was um, society on this planet prior to our written history, prior to what we know. Um, probably, you know, as old as 10 to 12,000 years ago. Um, and that would have been the end of their cycle. Uh, that was very advanced and that knew of that energy and that knew how to use it and and that might have had direct contact with very advanced beings that you know have discovered this maybe thousands and thousands of years ago on their own planet and have learned how to travel through the universe which is not you know on uh, conceivable I mean if you took us only a hundred years ago uh, we were in horse and buggies, um, you know, they, you wouldn't believe if at the time you would have gone to somebody in a horse, you know, a horse and buggy driver uh, and told him that within a few generations we'd be going to the moon. Um, that would have been very hard to understand for them. Well, you know, there's most likely civilization in our universe. And as we're finding out more and more in astrophysics, uh, there is a lot of evidence that there's most likely a lot of life in our universe everywhere, that the universe is teeming with life. There's most likely civilization that have thousands and thousands of years of advancements on us. And there is evidence that these very ancient civilizations had some contact with very advanced um, civilizations that give them very important information. And they use that information and developed and, and were very successful according to some of the findings we're, um, we're uh, you know, finding out now. Um, and, they, um, and then there was a, a fall. Uh, there was a change. Um, maybe that cycle ended. Uh, there's evidence as well that the Earth goes through cycles of uh, uh, cataclysmic destruction. And, you know, and there was the meltdown of the Ice Age and the Great Flood, which is a story that's found in all these ancient civilizations all around the world. And, um, you know, and so there was a fall of this civilization. Maybe, you know, they moved on. Uh, some of them but certainly there's evidence of their passage and this evidence is very very uh, prominent meaning we're talking not just legends and text but as well huge construction huge buildings that are found all around the world that many of them define defy anything we could build today with our most advanced technology and that's like straight up facts you know you can do the math and when uh, and and so there's a lot of evidence that there was something very powerful uh, and very advanced uh, going on on our planet um, very very long time ago and that we lost that knowledge yeah. and um, and maybe that was somewhat coordinated uh, and uh, for reasons that have to do with our level of maturity. You know, when you look at our world, when you look at our level of consciousness, when you look at what we do, um, you know, all this knowledge actually re-emerged in 
the 30s, the 20s with Russell and uh, 30s with, you know, um, Tesla and, and all many, many advanced thinkers and researchers have come to conclude that there's this energy and that there must be ways to tap into it and investigate it and got some success in some case to do so. Um, however, our society was not ready. Our society was not in the appropriate place to be able to handle that. Um, you know, there was not really any reason to think that we needed to find new source of energy. We had petrol, you know, and oil. And, you know, at the time it was thought that we were most likely never going to run out, you know, we, and so on. So in general, there was no tension the, the tension necessary to make that happen. However, now is a completely different scenario.